Beloved congregation, the Lord Jesus Christ has many names, all of which describe his work, his character, his mission. And one of those names or titles of him is that he is the surety of his church. What is a surety? A surety may be defined as someone who is legally bound with and for another person in the sense that he is liable for his debts, defaults, and failures. The word surety, although it is found in scripture, is only mentioned a few times. And that may give people the impression that it is not a very important part of Jesus' work, that he is the surety of his church. But that would be wrong. It is his being a surety that contains such a precious aspect of the Lord's work for his church. He is responsible for every one of his children. He has taken their place and he has suffered and died in their place and to bring them to glory. We have an example of of, uh, the word surety way back in the book of Genesis where we read that Judah said to his father Jacob that when Judah had said Joseph, whom they did not know was Joseph, but the leader in Egypt had insisted that next time they would bring, that the next time they would go to Egypt, they would bring with them also Benjamin, the youngest brother. And then Jacob is very upset, and he says, if you're going to take Benjamin as well as Joseph has already been taken from me, then I will be very, very full of of distress and and tears. But then Judah says to his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Here you see an example of what the word surety implies. Judah wants to be responsible for him so that even if harm would be done uh, to him, then he would assume full responsibility for it. But it is also true that the word surety is applied to the Lord Jesus when it says in Hebrews 7, verse 22, that he has become the surety of a better covenant. Comparing to the Old Testament, the New Testament is richer, and the Lord Jesus there is described as the surety. Again, in the same sense in which I just explained what happened to uh, Judah and And what would happen to uh, Benjamin had things gone wrong, the Lord Jesus Christ will make everything right for his church by assuming their sin and their guilt. And so that sums up what Christ is for his people, that he is their surety. He has bound himself to them taking full responsibility for them, for their sin and for their guilt. As the people's surety, the Lord has done for them what they could never do for themselves. He would fulfill all the demands of God's holy law. This representative work or that surety ship started already right after our Savior's birth. Having been made like unto his brethren, Jesus, like any other Jewish boy, 
is circumcised on the eighth day. And when he is 40 days old, his parents take him to the temple. And there they dedicate him to the Lord. At the age of 12, he is taken to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast there. And as we will see now, when he is 30 years old, he is baptized in the Jordan River. We will meditate on this important experience in the life of our Savior, and we will see what he is going to do for his people. We read in Matthew 3, verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And so I will be speaking this afternoon on Jesus' baptism by John. And we see three things here. First of all, the mark that this baptism of Jesus by John marks the end of John's preparatory ministry, signals the beginning of Jesus' substitutionary ministry, and thirdly, ensures the Spirit's empowering ministry. What happened on that momentous day was that Jesus first appeared to not only John, but also to the people that were being baptized there in the River Jordan. It was probably late in the afternoon when Jesus arrived at the scene where John was baptizing his converts. Luke, in his gospel, suggests that the people were still being baptized so that John might have been too busy to even notice the Savior's arrival. Possibly, the Lord Jesus stood in line with other inquirers. And when it was his turn, he indicated that it was his desire to be also baptized by John. I can just picture the scene, the, the expression on, on John's face as he saw Jesus standing there. We read in John 1, verse 31, that the Baptist says about Christ, I did not know him. Now, that may be for you a puzzling statement. He did not know Jesus? Well, in a sense he didn't, and in another sense he did. He certainly does not mean that he had no acquaintance at all with his blameless relative, for you know that Jesus was his cousin. When Jesus was, before Jesus was born, his mother Mary went to see Elizabeth, and then it says that as soon as he crossed the threshold into Elizabeth's house, that the baby leapt in, leaped in, in his mother's womb. That was already establishing a connection between the Baptist and, 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 and Jesus. But being an infant in, in, the, in the pregnancy of, of, of Elizabeth, she had not yet borne him, but he was already showing activity and, and an awareness in a way that something great was going to happen. But John did not know that he was going to be the Messiah. He knew him in the sense that he certainly knew his cousin. He must have seen him many times. But he had never understood, nor had it been revealed to him, that Jesus was the Messiah whose coming he was sent to announce. He had not recognized yet his true identity. And therefore, in that sense, he could say, in all honesty, I did not know him. But John did know something about him, namely that he was aware of his blameless character and his holy life. And therefore, when his great cousin came to present himself for baptism, 
John felt that this was completely out of the question. There was a world of difference, after all, between him, Jesus, and all the other candidates for baptism. These publicans and sinners, these Pharisees and scribes, soldiers and harlots, they had every reason to repent of their sins and to be forgiven. That was the only help, hope they had that their sins might be, be forgiven. But surely there was no such need for Jesus. He was holy, harmless, undefiled. And the people around him, they, they knew that. He was so different. And so it's no wonder that John says, I, I, I don't need... I don't need to baptize you. But I have that need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? That's absurd. The stern preacher of the law, as John was, whose voice caused sinners to tremble as he warned them against the wrath to come, he knew that he too was a poor, wretched sinner. And therefore, how could he baptize Jesus? But the Savior insists. He knows that this is the will of his heavenly Father. And so he says to John, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, he says to John, it is necessary, John, for both of us to do our part of the work that God has given us to do. And by saying this, the Lord Jesus acknowledges the divine authority of John the Baptist. He recognizes him as his forerunner, his herald. John is the last and the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He is about to close the Old Testament era. As another Elijah, his work has been to prepare Israel for the Messiah. By preaching the law, he had to make room in sinners' hearts for the gospel. And his ministry had been richly blessed. Many people had already come to him. They had heard him warn against the judgment to come. And they had been convicted of their sins. Many of them, not all of them, of course, but a good number of them, apparently. And they had confessed their sins. And they had sought baptism as a symbol of the sincerity of their repentance. And by going down into the waters of the Jordan River, they testified thereby that they deserved to perish in the waters of God's wrath. But as they came up out of the water again, they waited for God's mercy, which, according to John, was going to be revealed very soon. He knew that Jesus was about to come and to reveal himself. But little did he realize that it was going to be that day. The baptism of John, you see, was necessary, but not sufficient to salvation. More had to happen. And John himself admits this. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Water showing the need to be cleansed. But he who comes after me is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So in this way, John pointed sinners away from himself to the coming one. Shortly after this, he understood now what was in, involved in the coming of Jesus when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But, you know, he had been 
sent by the Father, that is, John the Baptist had been sent by God to announce the coming of the Savior, but he had focused all his attention on the necessity of repentance. And so he had preached the law. And congregation, that is still necessary, even though I use as my first point that it marks the end of John's preparatory ministry, but that doesn't mean that that we don't need to hear the law anymore. Long after John the Baptist, it is still very important that the law is preached. But John had to realize that his appearance and his ministry was about to be succeeded by the ministry of another one, and that is Jesus. But let's not mis- misunderstand this. The preaching of the law is still very important, also today. That is why also the Apostle Paul says it is by the, the law that we receive the knowledge of our sin. The law, however, can do no more than condemn us. It can do no more than expose sin and awaken guilt in us. But it cannot save. Only Jesus can do that. And so the Savior knows that in a certain sense, the Baptist's work is finished as far as the Baptist himself is concerned. John has fulfilled now his part of the divine righteousness. The requirements of God are about to be laid aside for John. And that's why he also says, He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And that was hard for John because soon many of the ones that he had baptized followed Jesus, beginning with his disciples. They, they, two of them, John and, and James, they, they, they followed Jesus right after he announced that the Lamb of God had come. And that was painful, in a sense, for John when he saw within a few weeks and months that many people were leaving him and joining Jesus and his people that were his disciples. But the point that is essential for us to understand is that it marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it begins here, on that day, with his baptism. And so John finally agrees. He is persuaded by Jesus to go ahead and perform that that sacrament. And so soon both of them go down into the water. And John baptizes Jesus. Yes, He baptizes the one whose shoes he is not worthy to bear. What a touching scene it is. Jesus is immersed in the waters of Jordan. Just like all the other candidates for baptism. Why did Jesus do this, you ask? Because baptism of Jesus was a part of the righteousness which he had to fulfill, the mission he had to accomplish. What happens here is this, that Jesus accepts his office as Messiah. Indeed, he had been appointed to that office already in eternity, in the Council of Redemption or the Council of Peace, where the Father appointed His Son, the second person of the Trinity, to come to this earth, this sin-cursed world, to be the Savior of lost sinners. But His missionary or His messianic work had begun in time. Started in Eternity, but it was 
becoming reality in time. And that, that surety work, this messianic work, had begun in time with his circumcision. Shortly after his birth. But that had taken place without his knowledge. He was, after all, a baby like any other. Truly human. He was an infant. And that means he could not act consciously. But now it is about 30 years later. He was now mature. He could act consciously and voluntarily. By having himself baptized, Jesus now publicly accepts the work that his father had given him to do. And this acceptance involved a conscious awareness of being one with his people. And that's why he was baptized here by John. A sinner who applied for the baptism of John acknowledged thereby that he deserved condemnation. Those people that came flocking from Judea and the whole country uh, who sought by repenting of their sins baptism, they could only do this if they agreed with the fact that they were sinners deserving God's wrath. But that is also how Jesus enters the water of Jordan. Not because he was a sinner himself or that he was in the least involved in any impurity. He was totally without personal sin. But he went down into the Jordan as the surety and the substitute of a sinful people with whom he had become one in every respect. His elect. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And here we see what this meant for him. He is united to his people. Well, picture yourself. Picture that before you now. Here goes the head of his church. And he enters the waters of death laden with the sins of his people. Isaiah puts it this way, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the Apostle Paul says in, in one of his letters to the Corinthians, he, he was made to be sin, who had no sin, but he did that, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a tremendous comfort there is in this passage for those who see themselves as miserable, guilty sinners. Beloved, here is your surety. Here is your substitute. He identifies himself with you. He is not ashamed to enter the baptismal waters together with publicans, harlots, and soldiers, as well as scribes and Pharisees. It is no wonder that John could not understand this. Christ identifying himself with wretched sinners, slaves of Satan, sin, and death. John was a preacher of repentance. That is how he is characterized in Scripture. That doesn't mean he had nothing to do with the gospel, but his function was to show the need of repentance for the nation and for the, the, relig the religion in that country. Israel's leaders, they had to repent. And so before baptizing anyone, he would warn them what would happen to those who did not repent. And that's how he puts it. Now also the axe is laid 
unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Soon the Messiah would come. John expected that anyway. That he would come, axe in hand, to cut down all unrepentant sinners. John's preaching had been successful. It had struck many people with, like lightning. But let me ask a question. Have you ever been struck like that? Has that ever happened in your life? That you were hit or touched by the preaching of God's holy word. John did have the joy of seeing much fruit on his labors. There they were. Dozens, if not hundreds of them lying there on the banks of Jordan praying for mercy. And many of them asked for baptism smiting themselves on their chest and praying, God, be merciful to me. My transgressions I confess, grief and guilt my soul oppress. Have you ever prayed like that? Then you will agree with God's righteous judgment. You will say, Lord, it is only just if I will have to be cast away. That is what I deserve. But you know, for such self-condemned people, there is hope. The Lord will remember them in grace. Listen, our text says, Then Jesus comes from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by him. The key word here is, then Jesus came. When did he come? At the very moment when sinners were being baptized, confessing their sins and praying for mercy. It is at that point that Jesus comes. And how does he come? That's important to know that. Does he come with an axe in his hand to cut down those trees of wickedness? No, he doesn't do that. And why doesn't Jesus destroy these publicans, harlots and Pharisees? Because he himself would say later to Nicodemus during that important discussion they had, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 17. Then Jesus came. Taking off his outer garments, he enters the waters of baptism. And by doing that, he wants to say to all, all repentant sinners, take courage, you who condemn yourself because of your sins, you who think it is impossible for you, for you to be saved, you deserve condemnation, you know, you know. But look, I am going down with you into the Jordan. That means into the condemnation that you deserve but I go with you. I go bearing your sins. Do you think then that I should take up the axe to cut you down? No, I am your surety. I am your substitute. Therefore, I lay down my head right next to yours under the same axe of God's judgment. I have come to save you. Oh, how precious Jesus becomes to those who have eyes of faith. See him going down into that river. He did this for sinners like you and me. Here is hope for those who have lost all hope 
of saving themselves. Jesus' baptism is a symbol of his death and resurrection. That means if you, by faith, go down with Jesus into the waters of death, you will also come up out of those waters with him to live the resurrection life. I live, Jesus says, and therefore you shall live also. And so Jesus' baptism marks the beginning of his public ministry. He has made the first step in the direction of Calvary. A heavy task awaits him. An impossible task, even for Jesus' human nature. And therefore Jesus needs to be equipped for this great work. And this equipment the Savior receives right after his baptism. It says in verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What's happening here? Jesus received the Holy Spirit after his baptism. No, that does not mean that he did not have the Spirit before that. Right from his birth, the Spirit was with him. Actually, before his birth, because the Bible says that that the Spirit made him body. Everything about Jesus depended on the Spirit. His very conception was of the Spirit. The body that grew in Mary's womb was the body that the Holy Spirit had given to her. But then also later as he grew up, the Spirit was with him, equipping him. That is such a tremendous text where it says in Hebrews 9 that the Lord Jesus gave his sacrifice on the cross. His was the blood which was shed at Calvary and that was made possible through the eternal spirit who offered himself without spot. You cannot divorce the work of Christ and that of the Spirit. It was the Spirit who gave him the power, the strength, to go to Calvary and to die for sinners. It all fits together. The Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. Why? Why the picture of a dove? Because Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace, not to condemn, but to save. If you want to describe John the Baptist and attach a certain picture to him, then you would say he looks and he appears like an axe, a sword, a weapon of vengeance, of condemnation. But here's the complete opposite. Here's Christ, who received the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. The dove pictures, preaches love, peace, gentleness. What an encouragement that is or should be for all of us that he is the gentle savior who will not turn away a poor sinner who confesses his sins and who cries for mercy. Yes, it is true and it has to be said that this is not all that we need to know. One day, the Lord Jesus 
will be, like John the Baptist, a stern judge who will condemn all people who reject him. Yes, then the axe will cut down all unfruitful trees. But now it is the day of grace. Now he is still the compassionate Savior, and he's the only Savior. Do you know him? Do you need him? Do you seek him? After the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus, a voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And here we see the Trinity at work. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, accepts his mission, his task, as surety, having been given that, uh, that mission and that commission by the first person of the Trinity, God, and of the third person of the Holy Spirit. And it is all summed up by God saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And what does that imply? Well, the God is perfectly at agreement with what Jesus is doing and what has just taken place. The voice of God the Father is, says that he is pleased with Jesus. Why? Because he identified himself with sinners. So God was pleased with his son. Are you? Am I? Part of our salvation is that we learn to see that whatever the Lord Jesus has done was good and necessary and, and perfect, and therefore we should agree with him too and should be pleased with him too. That is the question, therefore, that everyone must answer. Are you pleased with Jesus? What, what think ye of the Christ? Jesus once asked the people that were mulling around him, milling, uh, what do you think of me? Yes, what do you think of me? How many people have no use for him? We are living at a time when the masses also are rejecting the Savior, the only Savior. And they want to stay with their sins. That is what they're pleased with. Away with all the laws, all the regulations, leave me be, I want to make my life a pleasure satisfying myself with all the worldly pleasures there are how terrible but uh, they're not only living in the world there are also people in the church let us be careful that we learn to choose Christ and that we do so being very pleased with him because he is the only savior and he is the one that that is willing to save even me. And so I must answer this way. Do you love Christ? While he proffers peace and pardon, let us hear his voice today, lest if you, your heart should harden, you should perish in the way. Lest if ye so unbelieving, he in judgment shall declare, ye so long my spirit grieving, never in my rest can share. May that never, never happen to you. Rather seek him and live. And he who comes to me, Jesus says, no matter who it is and what he has done, I will never, never cast out. Amen.